ازيكم عاملين ايه انا محدش حاول يتواصل معايا على الايميل آه هل ده معناه انكم فهمتوا المحاضرات اللي اتبعتت لكم الاسبوع اللي فات ولا معناه ان محدش لسه حاول يبص في المحاضرات كمان آه ابن تيتشنج اسيستنت آه استاذه دعاء كانت بتقول ان محدش حاول يبعت لها على الايميل بخصوص الشيت اللي هي كانت بعتته لكم يا ريت تبداوا تقروا المحاضرات لو ما كنتوش بداتوا علشان ما تتراكمش عليكم وتتواصلوا معايا على الايميل في حاله وجود اي ملاحظات او استفسارات We are going to start the lecture of the 23rd of March by introducing a new concept related to sufficiency as we said Uh, in the lectures of last week, there are two methods for showing that a certain statistic is sufficient for a parameter. The first method is by obtaining the conditional distribution of the likelihood uh, function given the sufficient statistic and proving that it does not depend on the parameter. Whereas the second uh, method is by using the factorization theorem. Uh, remember that if it is difficult to obtain the distribution of the statistic, we want to prove that it is sufficient, we will not be able to use the first method and we have to use the factorization theorem. Also, the factorization theorem uh, if, uh, is useful if you are not given the statistic which you want to show that it is sufficient or not. Here again, you will not be able to use the first method and you have to use the factorization theorem And if you succeed in writing the likelihood function as the product of two terms, one of them is a function in a certain statistic and the parameter, and the other one does not depend on the parameter, then this means that this statistic is sufficient for the parameter. Now uh, we are going to uh, consider the concept of uh, jointly sufficient statistics. Uh, what does uh, this concept mean? The definition. If we assume that we have a random sample x1, x2 till xn of size n from a certain probability dense, density function or a probability mass function denoted by f of x and theta, where the parameter theta may be a vector, a set of statistics t1, t2 till tr is said to be jointly sufficient if and only if the likelihood function can be written as uh, 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 the product of two uh, terms. The first term is H, which is a function uh, in the jointly uh, sufficient uh, statistic T1, T2, till Tr, and the parameter theta. Here theta is uh, possibly a vector. Uh, it means that it can be more than one uh, parameter. Time, uh, K, which is a function in Uh, the observations x1, x2 till xn. Uh, here, a k uh, does not depend on theta. Uh, notice here that uh, uh, this concept uh, is uh, a generalization uh, of uh, the uh, uh, factorization uh, theorem, which we talked about before. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, the factorization theorem, Uh, it was uh, used to prove uh, sufficiency if we have only one uh, sufficient statistic for uh, only one uh, parameter. But here we have uh, more than uh, uh, one sufficient statistic, uh, two or more sufficient uh, statistics, which are together uh, jointly sufficient for, more, for uh, uh, one parameter or more. Now we are going to to illustrate the concept of jointly sufficient statistics through an example. In this example, we have a random sample of observation x1, x2 till xn drawn from a normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared. We want to show that x bar, the sample mean, and x squared, the sample variance, are jointly sufficient statistics for the parameters mu and sigma squared. Uh, first of all, we know that the probability density function of uh, x, which follows normal mu and sigma squared, 
is given by uh, 1 over root 2 pi sigma uh, e raised to the power negative half um, uh, x minus mu over sigma all square. Here x takes values from negative infinity to infinity. Mu also is defined from negative infinity to infinity, whereas sigma squared is greater than zero. Uh, the likelihood function can be written as the product of the probability density function. Uh, and it is given by uh, 1 over 2 pi sigma squared all raised, all raised to the power n over 2 times uh, e raised to the power negative half summation xi minus mu squared over sigma squared. Uh, notice that sigma is the same as sigma squared power half. Here we have uh, used uh, sigma squared uh, because uh, after that we want to show that x bar and s squared are sufficient for mu and sigma squared. So we want uh, sigma squared to appear in the formula. Uh, recall that summation xi minus mu squared can be written as summation xi minus x bar plus x bar minus mu squared. Here, uh, when we add uh, x bar and subtract x bar, we uh, do not change the formula. And this is equal to uh, summation xi minus x bar squared plus n x bar minus mu squared. Uh, we have proved this uh, before in slide 6 in uh, the lecture of uh, 16 uh, marks. Now, uh, the likelihood uh, function uh, can uh, be written as shown uh, in the slide. Here we have uh, two terms. Uh, one of them does not depend on the parameters. Uh, this term is 1 over 2 pi raised to the power n over 2. Uh, we are going to call this term k. And uh, the other term depends on uh, x bar. It also depends on s squared and on mu and sigma squared. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, succeeded in uh, factorizing the likelihood function into two terms. One of them is h, which is a function of the jointly sufficient uh, statistics and the parameters. And the other one is k, which does not involve the parameters. Uh, so we can say that uh, x bar and s squared are jointly sufficient for mu and sigma squared. Remember, uh, I told you before that here we have uh, a generalization of the factorization theorem. There is a remark to say that if C1, C2, say CR is a set of jointly sufficient statistics for theta, where theta here is uh, possibly a vector, then any set of one-to-one -one transformations of the set of jointly sufficient statistics is also uh, jointly uh, sufficient, of course, for theta. In order to uh, illustrate uh, this remark, we are going to show that summation xi and summation xi squared are jointly sufficient uh, statistics for mu and sigma squared in the previous example. Remember that in the previous example, we considered a normal distribution with mean equal to mu and variance sigma squared. First of all, we know that summation xi and summation xi squared are one-to-one -one transformations of x bar and s squared. Uh, we took uh, the concept of one-to-one -one transformation before in the course of theory one. Therefore, uh, uh, it follows uh, from uh, the remark that uh, uh, summation xi and summation uh, xi squared uh, are jointly sufficient for mu and sigma squared. Uh, alternatively, we can prove that summation xi and summation xi squared are jointly sufficient for mu and sigma squared by applying the definition of jointly sufficient statistics. Now, we are going to prove that uh, summation uh, xi and summation xi squared uh, are jointly sufficient for mu and sigma squared by using the definition uh, of jointly sufficient statistics. We have, uh, of course, for the normal distribution that the likelihood function can be written as the product of the probability density function of the normal distribution 
and uh, this will be given by uh, the expression 1 over 2 pi uh, raised to the power n over 2, 1 over sigma squared raised to the power n over 2, uh, multiplied by e raised to the power negative half uh, uh, 1 over 2 sigma squared uh, summation xi minus mu squared. Now, note that summation xi minus mu squared can be written as summation xi squared minus 2 or twice xi mu plus mu squared. And this can be written as summation xi squared minus 2 mu summation xi plus n mu squared. Uh, this is because, uh, of course, summation mu squared is the same as n mu squared because uh, we have, of course, that mu squared is a constant. Uh, therefore, uh, if we uh, replace uh, summation xi minus mu squared by the term summation xi squared minus 2 mu summation xi plus n mu squared in the likelihood function, then the likelihood function can be written as shown uh, in this line. Uh, and this can be expressed as two terms. One of them is k. Uh, x1, x2, uh, till xn, uh, which is uh, given by 1 over 2 pi raised to the power n over 2, and this does not depend on the parameters mu and sigma squared, while the other term is h, which is as defined uh, in the slide, and this will be a function of, as you can see, it will be a function of summation xi, summation xi squared, uh, mu and sigma squared. Hence, we have uh, succeeded in uh, factorizing or putting the likelihood function as the product of two terms. Uh, one of them is a function of uh, uh, the jointly sufficient uh, statistics, which are uh, summation xi and summation xi squared, and the parameters mu and sigma squared, and the other term, uh, which is k, does not involve the parameters. Hence, we can say that summation xi and summation xi squared are jointly sufficient statistics for mu and sigma squared. Now, we have finished uh, the concept of uh, sufficiency. Remember, we have four properties of four criteria for the goodness of an estimator, they are unbiasedness, uh, efficiency, uh, consistency, and uh, sufficiency. Now we are going to move uh, to a, a second method for finding a minimum variance unbiased estimator. Uh, why do we say a second method? Uh, because before we have said that we can obtain Minimum variance of bias estimator through Cramer uh, row lower bound inequality by showing that we have an unbiased estimator whose variance is equal to Cramer row lower bound. Uh, but uh, Cramer row uh, method has many limitations. First of all, there is no guarantee that we can find an unbiased estimator whose variance satisfies Cramer row lower bound for the parameters of any distribution. And if we can find it, for a certain parameter, then it will not uh, uh, be it will be satisfied only for any linear function of this parameter. For example, if we can find it for theta, it will not be satisfied for one over theta because one over theta is not a linear function of theta. So we need another method for finding the minimum variance unbiased estimator in the case where Cramer uh, row lower bound inequality does not work. Uh, this second uh, method was uh, established by two uh, statisticians. One of them is called Rowe and the other one is called Blackwell. That's why it is called Rowe Blackwell theorem. So now we are going to talk about finding minimum variance on bias estimator using Rowe Blackwell theorem. What does this theorem say? It says that if W, uh, uh, w is any unbiased estimator of k of theta, where k of theta is a function of theta, and if t is a sufficient statistic for theta, uh, if we define phi of t uh, equal to the expectation of w given t, then phi of t is a statistic, i.e. it does not depend on theta, we are going to show this, 
uh, we are going to show also that the expectation of phi of t is equal to k of theta, i.e. phi of t is an unbiased estimator of k of theta, and also that variance of phi of t is less than or equal to variance of w, that is phi of t is a uniformly better estimator of k of theta. We mean by a uniformly better estimator, means that the variance of uh, phi of t is always less than or equal to the variance of uh, that. We can prove the first part of the theorem by using one of the following two methods. Uh, the first method, if we want to get phi of t, or the expectation of w given t, uh, we know that w is a function in the axis. It is a function in x1, x2, till xn. If we want to get the conditional uh, expectation of w given t, we can do it uh, by uh, integrating uh, uh, using the uh, conditional uh, joint distribution of the axis given t. Uh, the conditional joint uh, distribution uh, is the same as the conditional likelihood uh, function given t, which is L uh, x vector uh, given t. Uh, as uh, I said, this is because uh, W is uh, a function in the axis. So we can use the joint distribution, the conditional joint distribution of the axis or the likelihood function to get this uh, expectation. So here we are going to do uh, an uh, integration we are going to uh, integrate with respect to x1, x2 till xn, and uh, at the end uh, we can, as shown in the slide, and we, at the end we can get the expected value of w given t. And notice here that uh, w, as we said, is a function in the axis, uh, so it does not depend on theta. Also, uh, the conditional likelihood function uh, given t does not uh, depend on theta. Why? Because t. Um, is a sufficient uh, statistic. So from the definition of sufficiency, uh, the conditional uh, likelihood function given t does not depend on theta. When we do uh, the integration, also the result or the expected value of w given t will not depend on the axis. So it will not depend on the axis, it will not depend on theta, it will only be a function uh, in t. We call it phi of t. So uh, this uh, proves uh, that the expected value uh, of w given t or phi of t is a function in t only and it does not uh, involve theta, hence we can consider it as a statistic. Uh, now uh, we are going to prove uh, the uh, part one of the theorem of rho Blackwell by using a second method. Uh, if we want uh, to get the expectation of uh, w given t, instead of uh, obtaining it uh, by using uh, the conditional distribution of uh, the axis uh, or the conditional likelihood function given t, we can use the conditional distribution of w given t. Notice here that uh, the uh, conditional distribution of w given t uh, will not uh, depend on theta. This is, uh, in fact, a property about sufficient uh, statistics. We didn't mention it before, but it says that if we are uh, given, if, uh, if we know uh, the sufficient statistics T, the conditional distribution uh, of W given T uh, will not depend on theta because it is as if um, uh, knowing T absorbs all the information about theta. Uh, also here, uh, if, uh, of course, W does not depend uh, on theta, because as we said that W is a function in the axis, so if we integrate with respect to W, uh, the result, which is phi of t, or the expected value of W given t, will not depend on W, it will not also depend on theta, it will be only a function in t. Uh, so since phi of t uh, does not involve theta, we can say that it is a statistic. And now we want to prove parts 2 and 3 of the theorem, of rho blackwell theorem. Remember uh, what did uh, we say in uh, part 2? In part 2 we wanted to show that uh, phi of t is an uh, unbiased estimator of k of theta, whereas in part 3, 
we want to, uh, to show that variance of uh, phi of t is always less than or equal to variance of w, where w is any unbiased estimate. To prove part 2 and 3 of the theorem, we are going to use the following uh, two well-known uh, results, which you have studied before in the course of probability 2. You should have studied them in the course of prob uh, probability 2. Uh, what does uh, these uh, two well-known results say? say? It says that if we have two random variables, x and y, uh, then we can say that the expected uh, value of x is equal to the expected value of the expected value of x given y, and that the variance of x is, uh, uh, consists of two uh, components. One of them is the variance of the expected value of x given y, and the other component is the expected value of the variance of x given y. And now let's look at each uh, expression. For the first expression, the expected value of x equal expected value of expected value of x uh, given y, we notice that the inner expectation is with respect to x. So uh, if we, um, uh, for the inner expression, it will not depend on x because we are expecting or taking the expectation with respect to x, so it will depend on y. The outer expectation is with respect to y. So if we take the expected value of the expected value of x uh, given y, it will neither depend on x nor y. It will be a constant. This is equal to the expected value of x. The expected value of x means we are taking the expectation with respect to the marginal distribution of x. So the result, of course, will not depend on x, and it will also be a constant. For the second expression, the first uh, component uh, in uh, the uh, right-hand side, the variance of the expected value of x given y, we are getting this expectation uh, with respect to uh, x. So the result will not depend on x. Now we are getting the variance uh, with respect to the marginal distribution of y. So uh, the result also will be a constant. Uh, for the second component, the expected value of the variance of x given y, also the variance x given y, we are getting it with respect to x, with respect to the conditional distribution uh, of x given y. So the result uh, will not depend on uh, x. And uh, if we take after that the expectation, the expectation is with respect to the marginal distribution of y, so again the expected value of variance x given y will not depend on neither x nor y. So we will have uh, a constant, uh, and this constant will be equal to the variance of x. Variance of x is also a constant because we are taking the integration uh, or we're getting the variance with respect to the marginal distribution of x. So x will not uh, be, uh, the variance of x will not be a function in x. And uh, as I said, uh, I think you have taken these two expressions, you are uh, familiar with them or you have taken them before in the course of probability uh, 2. Now we are going to use uh, these uh, two expressions. If we replace x in these two uh, expressions by w and y by t, uh, then we can write the expected value uh, of x and the variance of x as follows. They will be the expected value of w is equal to the expected value of the expected value of w given t, which is equal to the expected value of phi of t. Remember, the expected value or the conditional expectation of w given t, we called it before phi of t because it's a function in t. Also, for the second expression, if we replace x by uh, w and y by t, we can say that a variance of w will be equal to variance of the expected value of w given t plus the expected value of variance w given t. Uh, now, uh, from uh, expression 1, we know that the expected value of uh, phi of t is equal to the expected value of w. Remember that w is an unbiased estimator of k of theta. Uh, so this means that the expected value of w is equal to k of theta. So also the expected value of phi of t will be equal to k of theta, which proves that phi of t is an unbiased estimator of k of theta. So uh, uh, this proves uh, part uh, 2 of the theorem. 
Also, if we go back to uh, the second expression, which, is, uh, which was about the variance, we have from the second um, uh, expression that the variance of W is equal to the variance of uh, phi of uh, 3 plus uh, the expected value of the variance of W given T. Uh, notice that the expected value of the variance of W given G is always greater than or equal to zero. Why? Because variance of W given G, any variance is always greater uh, than or equal to zero. So if we take its expectation, it will also be greater than or equal to zero. So from the second expression, we can say that variance of W will be greater than or equal to variance of phi of T. Uh, this means that uh, uh, phi of t is a uniformly better estimator uh, of k of theta than uh, w. Uniformly better means that its variance is always less than or equal to the variance of w, where w is uh, any uh, unbiased estimator. Uh, notice here that uh, this means that uh, phi of t is uh, a minimum variance unbiased estimator because its variance is always less than or equal to the variance of any other unbiased estimator. Uh, but uh, the question is, uh, is phi uh, of t the only minimum variance unbiased estimator? Is it a unique minimum variance unbiased estimator? We cannot say this from raw blackwell theorem. raw blackwell theorem does not give me any guarantee that this uh, estimator phi of t will be unique. But uh, using another uh, concept, uh, later on we are going to see how we can uh, obtain uh, a unique minimum uh, variance unbiased estimator for a certain parameter.